As uh, we, we love all of our missionaries and mission organizations, but it's special when they're bone of our bone. As David said, they, he and his bride, Victoria, were part of Summit Church. We're so proud of them and following God's call. So please come out to the Galleria, even just to say hello and, and uh, encourage their hearts. I know that would mean so much to them. My name is Orlando. I get to serve as one of the pastors and elders here with our wonderful team. If you have your Bibles, will you open with me to Genesis chapter four? Last weekend, we uh, invited you to be praying for our college students who are on their fall retreat uh, right now in Sarasota. Got word that as they're wrapping that up, they had a college student uh, trust Christ as their personal savior and they're getting ready to baptize eight college students right now in the Gulf. So praise God uh, for that. Uh, our intent is to, uh, you know, be over the next few months in the book of Genesis. We're not going to be able to cover all of the book of Genesis, but highlight some very important themes that we see throughout the book of Genesis. If you weren't here the last two weeks, Pastor Jamin did a phenomenal job, and I would encourage you to go to our website, our app, and listen to those. And even if you were here, to go back and listen to those two key uh, sermons. The book of Genesis is so foundational to our Christian faith. It's really important that we understand the book of Genesis. The, the word Genesis in the Hebrews mean, in Hebrew means beginnings or origins. And that's what we see, the beginning and origins of, of God's activity as he creates uh, all that we see, as he creates the world, as he uh, creates man and woman and gives them identity and worth, as he establishes the, the covenant of marriage. And then over the last two weeks, we saw Jamin cover what, how God is uh, uh, restoring what man through his sin and her sin broke. And we see God's good purpose in that. And we'll continue to see that today through Genesis chapter four. It's a very familiar story. We get a lot of language. Um, we've heard a lot of language come out of Genesis four throughout our culture. You see certain language of it used in movies and things like that. But here's what the word of God God has to say. Genesis chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Now many theologians and scholars believe why Eve is using this intentional language, I have uh, gotten this child. That word gotten there means that it, it has appointed or been delivered. If you remember back in Genesis chapter three, after the fall, God speaks to the serpent, to the enemy. And he says that there from the seed of a woman will come a man who will crush the head of the serpent. And many scholars and theologians believe that as Eve is receiving this son, Cain, she is thinking possibly that this is the promised one, the one that God had spoken of in the garden that would come to defeat and crush the enemy. In fact, the name Cain means appointed. It means apprehended. And so there's a good chance that she just may be thinking this. It goes on. And again, she bore his brother Abel. The word Abel, the name Abel means brevity, means short of life. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep. And Cain, a worker of the ground. And in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel. I mean, that, 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 that picture there is to turn his face in approval. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. And Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And, while, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Verse 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. 
When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Verse 15, then the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. The Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod. That word Nod means wandering, east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. Where, when he built, being Cain, a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad fathered Mehujael, and Mehujael fathered Methusael, and Methusael fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Ida, and the name of the other was Zillah. Ida bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal, and he was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. Zillah also bore Tabal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tabal Cain was Naamah. And Lamech said to his wives, Ida and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. Verse 26, to Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Now, there's a lot in Genesis 4 that we don't have answers for. How old were Cain and Abel uh, when all of this went down? Why was Abel a, a herdsman? And, and why did Cain till of the ground? Were there other people already on the earth when Cain and Abel were born? Who is Cain referring to when God cast his and executes his judgment on him? I mean, who did they root for? I mean, there's all sorts of questions that we don't have answers for. But the answers that we do know is that we're being presented with a story of two brothers bringing two offerings, two different postures, one losing his life and another having severe consequences. And what we're seeing here is what we've seen already in Genesis 2 and 3. And it's this, that God has a heart to restore that which sin taints and sin breaks. And so if you get anything, get this, and this is how we'll walk through this passage, is that God's good purpose is to demonstrate his care by confronting and dealing with sin Again, we've already been introduced to this in the book of Genesis. And if you're here today, you know Christ as your Savior. And if and we live on this side of the cross, then we know this to be true in our lives. That God is still demonstrating his great care for us by confronting and dealing with sin. And he has dealt with it perfectly through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Amen? If you're here today, you've never trusted in Christ, that's our greatest and earnest prayers that you would taste and receive for yourself the goodness of God through his gift, Jesus Christ. But what I wanna show you is how God does that in this passage and, and challenge us today to consider some things about our own life. God's good purpose is to demonstrate his care by confronting and dealing with sin. Here's a couple of things I want you to see today from this passage. That God's, God cares about the heart in worship. Now, we don't know whether or not Adam and Eve prior to this moment had offered up any offerings. We're not told uh, to this point that God had given instructions to Adam and Eve and to Cain and Abel of how these offerings were to be made. What we have here, though, is the very first recorded worship service, so to speak. And what we have here is that we have Cain and Abel both bringing an offering to the Lord. 
Now, an offering is a gift of reverence. It's a gift of allegiance. It's a gift of gratitude. And it's an act of worship and obedience. Now, however, we've already seen that though both brothers bring an offering, only one was received by God and the other was rejected. Now, there's a lot of conjecture and a lot of, of speculation on why was Cain's sacrifice or offering denied or rejected by God and why was Abel's. There, there are theories out there that God did not receive Cain's offering because it wasn't a blood sacrifice offering. He took Abel's because it was an animal sacrifice. And that seems to be a little bit inconsistent. And the reason is, is because as you read through the book of the Old Testament, you come to passages of scripture in 1 Samuel, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy to mention some, where we see that God does receive the offering of that which is tilled from the ground. So that wouldn't seem to be where we should really put all of our, our emphasis on. What's more explicit in this passage is not so much what is being offered up, but how it is being offered up. The issue isn't so much about the offering as much it is about the offerer. The problem was not the substance of the sacrifice or the, prop, the process of the sacrifice. The problem was in the heart of the person making the sacrifice. Go back to the passage. Don't take my word for it. Verse three. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. What does this all mean? Again, the problem isn't that Cain brought an offering from the ground and God wasn't feeling it that day. What the word is saying is that when Cain brought his, when Abel brought his offering, notice the language, he bought of the, firstborn of his flock, of the fat portions. What God is saying here is that God, that Abel brought of his best. And in bringing God his best, he is demonstrating his faith in God. This is, again, you see this language throughout the Old Testament, that God is always desiring that we give and bring his, us his best. And in so doing, we are, we are demonstrating our faith and our declaration in that moment is to say, God, all of this is from you anyway. It all belongs to you. And in faith, I can give you of my best and trust that if you desire me to have it again, you will bring it to me. It shows no intentionality in regards to Abel. It says that Abel just brings of the ground. Now, again, why is this so radically important? Because God cares about the heart more than he cares about outward actions. And if we're honest, if we're really, really honest, even as the best of believers, there are times that we just go through the motions and we play a certain part and we do a certain thing. And if we're honest, our hearts are far from the thing that we're doing. And if people had the opportunity to see into our heart, they would recognize that what we are portraying is just but a mirror, a, a, a projection of an image rather than the reality of where we are. And God will never, ever settle for that. In fact, the scriptures capture this later on in 1 John chapter 3, verse 12, in, in referring to Cain. It says, we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Meaning we don't want to be like Cain. We don't, want, we don't want to try to project something that we're not and all the while not attending to our hearts. It says about Abel in Hebrews chapter 11, what is known by many as the hall of fame of faith. We walked through a series here not too long ago through the book of Hebrews, Jesus is better. And this is what it says about Abel. By faith, Abel offered God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. And notice something really clear here in Genesis chapter 4. Don't miss this. It says that God looks at Abel and then his offering. 
says the same thing about Cain. God looks at Cain and then his offering. And it just may seem like it's semantics, but God is getting something across here very importantly. And it's this, that God always looks at the man first before he looks at their actions. God always will look at the woman first, meaning into her heart before he starts dealing with their actions. And that's not the way the world works, does it? The world is always looking on the outside. We make so many quick judgments about people based on what we see on the outside that we fail to recognize what really is the measure and the character of a person is what at times we don't see, their heart. My kids can obey me, but their heart can say a lot different things. Go upstairs. No one is tweeting that going, man, you should see my kids obey me. It's a beautiful thing. It's amazing. The outside is saying what? I'll go to my room. The inside is saying what? You better check your pillow before you go to bed. I mean, I don't know. (laughs) But the scriptures are clear. God looks at the heart before he even begins to weigh the actions. And I'm just having to ask myself those questions. Is there anything in my life today that, that I do out of rote or do, but, but my heart is far from that? We, we've heard of King David, known as the man who was after God's own heart, but a lot of that came after his moral and gross sinful failures. That after he was confronted with his sin and he finally is broken and repented of his sin, that he writes about that in Psalm 51. And this is what he pens under the authority of God's Holy Spirit. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. David is finally getting, oh God, if it was outward actions, man, I would have been okay a long time ago, but I'm starting to recognize it's not about that. It's about my heart. It's about humbling myself before you and allowing myself to be honest before you. That, God, is what you care about. As God is dealing with the people of Israel through his prophet Isaiah in the very opening chapter of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter one, here's what God's word says through Isaiah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the call of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity in solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my face from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Now, all of the things that the people of God were doing, God had had orchestrated them. He had commanded them to do them. But what he's saying now is you're doing them and you're going through the motion. You're doing them and your heart is far from the very action that you're bringing before me. So he's saying this, stop it. It's an abomination to me. I'm not going to allow you to play a game with me. How many of you men are married in this room today? Three. Some of you are wondering. You're in big trouble. One of the most haunting verses as a married man is found in 1 Peter 3. You know what 1 Peter 3 says? Husbands, live with your wives in a gentle and respectful way. Why? Because if you don't, your prayers will be hindered. God says, don't come to me about, oh God, 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 when you are not treating my daughter in the ways that I've commanded you. Again, what is it a sign of? Don't, 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 don't play a game. I weigh the heart. I care about your heart. And listen, it's awesome. This room is packed. Oh man, you got here at 10 o'clock. But listen, 
God is not impressed with our attendance alone. God wants to know where is your heart as you enter into this place? Is your desire like Abel's to give God of the best of what you have? And you go, what, what is the best? It's all of it. Let me, let me paint this out for us because it is not just about when we gather. It's about when we scatter that our hearts are still being revealed. Your workplace, that's a worship space. How is God worshiped by you where you work? Where you get your coffee, that's a worship space. America's temple, Target, that's a worship space. How you live in relationship with others, friends, family, wives, kids, all of that is a worship space. And God says, I care about your heart in those realms. I care about it. All of life as a believer is lived in response to the glory, the goodness, the grace, and the mercy of God. Amen? So it's right that God would say, oh, Cain, listen, it's not about what you brought. It is about your posture in which you brought it in. It is about your heart towards me. So the question to consider today as a child of God might just be, where is it in my life that I may just be going through the motion? You know, I went on a sabbatical and I'm grateful for that time. And God was confronting me with a lot of this stuff. If we really believe that we are as close to God and seeing God in his fullness <laughs> in our very next breath, then there should be a certain weightiness of that to recognize, man, I want to capture and maximize every moment. Am I going to be perfect? No, but even in my imperfection and my failures, my heart should be seen in that moment when I blow it with my kids. And the next moments out of, words out of my mouth are not, well, if you, but would just be, I'm sorry. Your dad needs the gospel just as much as you do. He cares about the heart. Maybe a question is, where is it in my life that I'm actually just, if I'm being honest, giving lip service to the Lord, but my heart might be far from him? You want to know another ha haunting verse? And when I say haunting, I'm not like, ah, no, you know what I mean? <laughs> Convicting. <laughs> Maybe that's a better word. We'll use that one. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he also will reap. It's convicting. Any place you might be just giving lip service? Is there any place you might just be going through the motions? And every space that God has us, that's a place of worship. And he cares about it. And he cares about our hearts in those spaces. That's why the Apostle Paul would write, whatever you do, work heartily, wholeheartedly, as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Do you believe that today? God cares about the heart and worship, but God also cares about killing the sin that seeks to destroy us. Go back to the passage. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, verse 5. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. That, that term very angry means it was hot to him. Meaning he wasn't at the, the bulk of anger yet, but it was simmering. And we know that, right? We, we got all kinds of reasons for that. It's because I'm Italian, I'm a Dominican, I'm short, I'm tall, I'm hungry. God's looking not just at the outward expression of Cain's face. He's like, I'm looking at your heart, man, and what I see is not good. It's starting to, ooh, it's simmering. And he says to him in verse six, and the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why has your face fallen? If you do well, you, will you not be accepted? 
And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Remember, we, we saw this already the last two weeks. Pastor Jamin has walked us through here. Notice God's care and God's heart here. Cain, you blew it, but I'm coming close for you. Cain, you missed it. You weren't even in the ballpark, but I'm coming for you. And Cain, as I'm coming for you, what's going on in your heart? Similar to when Adam and Eve fall, Genesis 3, 9, the most important and profound question in all the Bible. Where are you? Not a geographical question, it's a heart question. And here is God now doing his sculptic heart surgery on Cain. Cain, what's going on in your heart? Cain, why are you so angry? Cain, why, are your, why is your head so low? And what does Cain do? He doesn't want any of it. He doesn't, wanna, he doesn't want to address what God is trying to address with him. God's heart here is not for answers. God knows the answers. God's heart here is, is to invite Cain into this process, to encourage Cain to face his sin. Yet Cain just continues to go angry and embittered in his heart rather than to face his personal failure and sin. What does it mean when God says to Cain, if you do well, you will, will you not be accepted? God's saying to Cain, let's deal with your heart. This, isn't, this is not about your brother. It's not about your brother being better than you. This is not about what your brother offered and what you did. This is not about me showing favoritism to your brother. This is about the condition of your heart. Now, why is that so important? Because isn't that what we fall into the trap of sometimes? Well, it's about my wife. If my boss wasn't this way, if my neighbors, if things were just better and God's like, listen, I, I got all that. Let's talk about you. Let's talk about your heart. Let's talk about where you are with me. And as long as we play this game that the enemy goes, yeah, keep going that narrative, keep going that narrative. Because as long as you got your eyes on everyone else and everything else, you will never get the time with the Lord to deal with your own heart. Why is this so radically important? Because sin is serious. Sin never stays small and it's never happy staying small. When sin is left undealt with, it will grow and it is always seeking to destroy us. Notice the language here. God says, come on, Cain, let's steal your heart. This is the moment because if you don't deal with it, sin is crouching at your door. And it's the language that you can imagine. The imagery there is that of a lion or a tiger that, that isn't like, meow, adopt me. It's lurking, ready to pounce, saying, oh, man, we're going to eat well tonight. This is the perfect opportunity. Where could it be that sin is ready to pounce on you, on me? And don't we understand this, right? This is why Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. God is giving Cain a strong warning here. And it's the same warning that every child of God and the sound of my voice needs to take to heart. Listen, just as sin crouched at Cain's door, sin is crouching at yours and mine right now. And we must be aware then of unhealthy anger. We must be aware of the temptation to nurse a wounded spirit that can lead us to places of bitterness. Sin, again, is never satisfied staying small. It's always seeking to grow. It's always seeking to taint and it's always seeking to destroy. No one ever just happens into committing adultery. No one just happens to stumble into addiction. Where is it today? Maybe it's this, you know, innocent, flirty conversation, man, that you're having with somebody that's not your wife at work. Maybe it's sites that you're going to. 
Maybe it's, it's thoughts that you're having. Maybe it's conversations of gossip that you continue to perpetuate. Sin will never stay small. We all must take serious account of that. Always. John Owen wrote a book many, many years ago of the mortification of sin in believers. It's very famous. And in that book, he says, the choicest believers who are assuredly freed from the condemning power of sin, are yet to make their business all their days to mortify the indwelling power of sin. Make it your daily work. Be always at it while you live. Cease not a day from this work. Be killing sin or it will be what? Everybody, it will be what? Notice what John Owen says. You believer, you have been removed from the condemning power of sin. You have been forgiven. But the job of killing sin daily is not done yet. And we must be active with the Spirit in killing that thing. You guys know, I think Caucasians are funny. I love them to death. I just think you guys are funny. There are things that you guys do that Hispanics don't do. So I found this article. Yeah, no, that's not condemning. That's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. That's the, that, 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 that is the tapestry that is God's creativeness, right? So I found this article written back in December of 2015 where this Australian woman took a seven-foot boa constrictor as a pet. You guys are so funny. And so, and she would just let it roam in her house. And then all of a sudden, one night, she w- and, and one morning she wakes up, the boa constrictor's in the bed with her straight out, like, a, like just hard as a law. Second day, she wakes up again. Third day, fourth day, fifth day. Sixth day, she finally calls the vet and says, there's a strange thing happened that every morning I wake up, my boa constrictor is straight out, hard as a log, in the bed with me. He said, get out of the house quickly. Your pet is either going to have to be euthanasian or we're going to have to release it. It is sizing you up to eat you. And then I love the, I I love the, the author's summary of the story. Moral of the story. You've got to recognize the snakes out there. Just because they seem close to you and sleep in your bed, it doesn't mean their intentions are good. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, that's good, that, that's good, you should write that down. Why? Because spiritually it's so radically true. You got to recognize the snakes out there because just because they seem close to you and sleep in your bed, it doesn't mean their intentions are good. Where is it today? Where is it today? Where is it today that God in his care and his grace is just pressing in and saying, hey, we, you got some things here that are simmering and and they're, they're seeking to kill you and destroy you. Notice the progression. Abel, man, what's the deal with this offering? No, it's simmering. Let's deal with it. You know what happens? He goes out and he invites his brother for a walk and he kills his brother. And notice the progression of sin. And we'll talk about this in just a minute. God confronts him again. Again. And he's not ready to deal with it. And if you read to the end, you see Cain's lineage. And we get to uh, a man by the name of Lamech, which is one of his descendants. And Lamech takes it radical now. Lamech is the first polygamist. He takes two wives. See the progression of sin. He calls his wives together. I, I believe this is the first like, like thug in the Bible, like thug rapper, because he calls his wives in. And many commentators say that this is a song, literally, that he's saying. Some young man disrespected me, and I waxed him. I don't know. You see how radical of a jump? One, jealous rage. One, no one's disrespecting me. I end him. Now, I don't know. But I wonder what the lineage of his family would have been like if Cain had dealt with his sin. 
Fathers, and I'm speaking to myself, we got kids in our home, kids under our care. <laughs> there are things that we need to take attention to. I'd rather, I'd rather a man have a flip phone and live righteously. I'd rather you do away with all your cable channels and live righteously. I'd rather you set up boundaries in your office that make you, make you look strange and live righteously because sin is crouching at your door. And it's never satisfied to stay small. Amen? God cares about the heart and worship. God cares about killing the sin that seeks to destroy us. And here's the last thing. Ben, get ready. That God cares about those who are his and those who are not. Cain kills Abel. God comes to him. Where's your brother? Come on now. Come on now. There's grace here. Where's your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? I have no idea. Okay. Ground is calling up. And here's how God shows his grace. To the victim, he executes justice, right? As he executes his punishment over Cain, which is righteous of him to do. Notice what Cain's response is. It's not, oh God, I did wrong. It's like our kids when we punish them. Oh, this is so unfair. You're going to take my iPad for a week? What am I going to do? This is terrible. I'm calling DCF. That's never happened in my house. But, but like, they, they blow past what they've done, and they now want to talk about the unjust punishment. This is what Cain does. He doesn't want to talk about the fact that he just murdered his brother. He wants to talk about the fact that the punishment that God is now executing righteously over him is unjust. It's too much. Here's God's care again. Okay, Cain's thinking, if I leave here, somebody's going to kill me. So we don't know what the mark is that God puts over Cain, but we know that he does and nobody messes with him. Cain is able to move on with his life, but notice the progression of sin. Adam and Eve are thrown out of the garden. Cain is even thrown further out, and that's still the progression of our world today. Cain is able to have kids. He's able to now continue on. That is God's grace. I don't know why God didn't just smite him dead. But Jesus said in Matthew 5 verse 45 that God makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and he sends his reign on the just and on the unjust. How does God care for those that do belong to him? Can you imagine Abel that what he had offered up, now he gets to see in full. Remember how the story opened, that Adam and Eve possibly thought that Cain would have been the one that would come. Well, God shows his grace and his care for those that belong to him, because at the very end, they get another son, and his name is Seth. And you know who comes from the line of Seth? You guys are like, I oh, don't know, man. It's a hard one. <laughs> you trick question? Jesus. 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 What the enemy had meant for harm, God redeems. God is always showing his care. Now, what does this have to do with Jesus? Jesus. Every line of the Bible, every word, every phrase, every T crossed, every I dot dotted points to Jesus. Where do we see Jesus in this? Well, think about this. Cain, because of his sin, was sent out deeper out from the garden. Jesus, because of our sin, was sent up a hill carrying a cross so that we can get entry back in to God's beloved place. So as we close, I just want to read this over you. 
the words of Paul trip. The sad result of this story is this rebellious, unrepentant, murderous man is driven out into the wilderness as a fugitive. But you can't read the account without remembering another fugitive driven away from the presence of his father, willing to hear and see his father turn his back on him. That fugitive is no other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So that there would be hope for us. So that the war for our hearts could be won. So that growth and change could happen inside of us. So that we could have moments where we would actually love our Lord with purity of heart. Serve him with purity of motive. So that there would be a day when we would stand before him. And the tiger that is crouching is dead. And we worship and we serve and we minister with absolute and complete purity of heart. Even so now, Lord Jesus, come quickly. May we be humble. May we be wise. May we, as we serve and as we worship, remember there is still a war going on. And may we worship and serve in joy and in humility at the sacrifice that's been made for our rescue. Amen. God, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you that you have demonstrated your great care in dealing for our sin through the perfect life, death, and victorious resurrection of your son Jesus Christ on our behalf. Oh God, that's a gift we could not earn and that's a gift we don't want to plunder away with low living. God, may your spirit that is the seal of our salvation lead us to live lives in response to the gospel that are worthy of you. And when we fall, God, may that same spirit bring us to places of confession and repentance before you. Lord, I pray that you would search every heart, including mine. God, where is that enemy crouching? Where is it, God, that maybe we've been going through half-hearted discipleship, half-hearted worship? Where is it that our actions do not reflect the honesty and the integrity of our heart? Oh, God, in your grace, show it to us. And may we be humble to confess it to you. Lord, if there's one here today that's never received your son as their savior, then God, I pray that today they would come to recognize that's the only way to be dealt with. That's the only way you deal with sin. And it's the only way we could have forgiveness from you is through the work of another, the perfect work of Christ. So Lord, bring you turn hearts to you today. We love you. May you be worshiped well right now. And in the moments after this moment, you're worthy of those hearts. You're worthy of such lives. You're worthy of such adoration. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say, amen. amen. Would you stand with us? The Lord bless you. Thanks for being here this morning.